Sharp, Reverend Brian Sharp, who we, we enjoy having so much and we love the scripture, these um, sermons and just enjoy them and the witness that he brings to us. First thing on the agenda today, I, before I forget, we found this little pin, this old pin of an angel, and it was found up front here. I don't know if it was left on the funeral or if it belongs to anyone here. Anyway, I'm going to put it uh, up here on this podium. And um, uh, Jim is going to come to it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Saturday, April 27th is the men's breakfast. Um, so in the spirit of reconciliation, equality, and tolerance, the men of Memorial Presbyterian Church invite men of Memorial, men and women of Memorial, men, women, and children of Memorial, and men, women, and children of Central Alberta to our April 27th breakfast. So that's next Saturday morning. Uh, hot breakfast will be served at 8.30. It's best if you arrive uh, shortly after 8.00. Our guest speaker next Saturday will be, and this is why it's a special occasion, will be Carol Kelly of Medicine River Wildlife Center. And there may also be a special guest coming with Carol. And uh, some of you may know who that is, but in any event, uh, if, you, if you want to see the special guest, great time for a photo op, by all means come. Uh, if you can attend, we ask that you please bring friends, especially children. We just need to know numbers, so please register before the meeting room by calling Robin, our, our administrative assistant, at 403 887 5702, that's the church name, or email uh, memorial at uh, memorial underscore office at shaw.ca. Hope to see many of you there. Um, on the session. 
which I haven't read yet, but I will. Anyway, that's Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday is uh, donations to PWS and D. We're calling it our birthday cake Sunday, which we've had for many years. Um, everyone sits at the table for the month that you were born and uh, put in a donation. And we have 12 cakes there. Well, actually, we only have 11 cakes. So if someone would please come forward. It doesn't have to be a home day to cake. Pick it up at Sobeys or whatever. But we need one more cake for the month of December. If you can help out, you can sign the sheet that's by the, uh, the coffee machine. That's next week. Um, there will be a short multimedia meeting in the fellowship hall after church today. Ask the people upstairs in the rafters, and maybe if they're not working this week, upstairs in the rafters. Um, please don't forget about the food bank. The last week of every month, we designate food bank Sunday, and they always need our items, our cash, and our prayers. Uh, concerning uh, the gentleman who's coming to preach for the call, Reverend, uh, not Reverend yet, Wilson Eon is his name, E Y O N G. And Wilson is coming the weekend of um, May 4, 5, 6. There will be an open house with Wilson on Saturday, May 4th in the fellowship hall, so we'll have coffee and uh, you can talk to him either as a group or individually a chance to meet him informally. He will be preaching for the call here in the sanctuary Sunday, May 5th, and there will be a giant potluck after that service. Um, this month we has a donation of lasagnas that were not needed at the uh, Bibles for Grads banquet, so the main course is all taken care of. We're asking the congregation to bring things like um, salads, sides, buns, desserts. So you don't have to worry about bringing the uh, main dishes. I think I've got everything. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning's service of worship to those course that have gathered here in the sanctuary, but also to those that are joining us online. I'd ask you to um, join me in our call of worship. It's from Psalm 100 verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. And that his faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's worship God as we sing him four, six, seven. Praise my soul, the God who crowns you. Oh. 
Let's come before God in prayer. Father, you are the one who created this world and gave us life. You are the one who made it good. And without your constant presence, there is disorder, chaos, trouble. Father, we too often forget you and too easily go our own way. We forget that you depend on us as your people. If your ways are to continue to grow, be made known among those that we meet. In this time of confession and reflection, we acknowledge that we have neglected to serve you in this world as your witnesses. We confess that we fail to say the right thing when the opportunity arises. We say things and do things too hastily and are slow to give you credit for the gifts that you have given us. Often we think only of ourselves and we forget or we neglect the needs of others. You give each of us the seeds of faith, but we don't always take the opportunity to grow that faith. You give us the calling of Christ to become fishers of men and women, but too often we decide where to cast our nets and then only to pull them up empty. Help us to hear your son's voice and to let down our nets where he directs us so that life becomes fuller and hope returns. Father, in your mercy, know our failures. And in your love, forgive us our wrongs. Give us, we pray, the assurance of a forgiven people. And renew us with your spirit, that we might become a stronger and better people. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The assurance of pardon that I've chosen for this morning comes from Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16, where God says, I will save those who love me, and I will protect those who acknowledge me as their Lord. When they call me, I will answer them. I will rescue them and honor them. I will be with them when they are in trouble. I will reward them with long life. I will save them. Believe then in God's love and his mercy. Believe in his son Jesus Christ and believe that in our Lord and Savior, each one of us is forgiven and blessed with new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let's sing hymn number 350, To God Be the Glory.
that gift of music to the choir. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you might prepare our hearts so that we can better hear and accept your holy word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. For we ask this in Jesus' name. By this time, however, our youngest 
son, Matthew, who was only four years old, was keen to be included. He wanted a rod, too, and a chance to catch a fish. Well, it was a small town, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and that local hardware store wasn't open. And we figured that Matthew would just be going through the motions of fishing anyway. And so we took a short piece of delving, tied a string to the end of it, and put a hook on the end of the string. Baited it with a worm, and we figured it would keep him happy just dangling it in the water while Willie and Ben did some real fishing. At the river, Willie and Ben decided to cast out into the middle of the channel as they had seen other fishermen do, cast after cast, but every single time they reeled in that line, there wasn't a single fish that would bite. Matthew, meanwhile, standing on the floating dock and dangling his hook in the shallows between the dock and the shore, and within about two minutes, he had a little fish flopping around on the end of his line. <laughs> Allison unhooked the fish for him and put it in a bucket of water so that we could release it again later. And Matthew was so excited, and as he dropped his line back into the water, he innocently asked his brothers the same question Jesus had asked the disciples. Haven't you any fish? <laughs> Of course, Willie and Ben were not impressed with their little brother, and they just tried harder to catch their own fish, casting farther and farther out into that channel, but still they caught no fish. Matthew caught a second, <laughs> and a third one, and a fourth one. And every single time he caught one, he would spin around and say to his brothers, haven't you any fish? <laughs> And he tried to encourage his brothers to try fishing on his side of the dock, closer to the shore. But his directions went unheeded. The boys had real fishing rods, and they didn't want to just dangle the line in the shallow water. They continued to cast, cast out into that deep water because they had seen other fishermen doing this, and they were catching fish. It had worked before, so why wouldn't it work now? At the end of the afternoon, the score for fish caught was <laughs> Willie and Ben with their fancy new rods, zero. Matthew, believe it or not, Matthew with his stick and string, 17. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you any fish? <laughs> Try the other side. Jesus saw that the disciples were having no luck whatsoever. They'd been fishing all night and no fish to show for. They had cast their nets again and again, but they labored in vain. So Jesus said to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, we're told, that they were unable to haul the nets in because of the large number of fish. Now, maybe from the shore, Jesus could see more clearly a school of fish gathering near the right side of the boat. Perhaps he could see more clearly than the men who had worked hard all night and whose eyes were tired from looking and searching for hours on end. But still you have to wonder, I mean, Jesus tells them the obvious thing. If they haven't caught any fish on one side of the boat, then cast their nets on the other side of the boat. Surely they had already done that. Surely they had not been out all night and only been casting their nets on one side of that boat. And why the immediate success when they followed Jesus' suggestion? Why the miracle? of abundance with just one cast. Was this just a story about fishing? Or was Jesus telling his disciples something other than how to fish with success? Was this about something deeper? 
something more profound, something more spiritual than the simple act of fishing. I believe it is. It is about something more. And that's because those disciples in that boat that day needed something more in that moment. Just as Jesus had appeared to Mary at the empty tomb to bring her comfort and hope, just as he had appeared before his disciples in a locked room to dispel their fear, just as Jesus had appeared to Thomas to remove his doubt, so in this moment Jesus appeared to these men in their fishing boat to challenge them to a new way of living life. This story is not so much about fishing, as it is about what brought the disciples to fish. Why were they there in the boat in the middle of the night? Why that particular moment? And more importantly, why Jesus appeared to them there? This was a dark and confusing time for those disciples. They were grieving and numb, and they were having a hard time understanding who they were and where they belonged in a post-Easter world. Following the resurrection of their Lord and his appearances to them, the disciples still had this great confusion and sadness over what had happened with the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. They were mourning the end of their friendship with Jesus and a ministry that seemed to have hit a brick wall. They were mourning for a teacher who had been rejected and cruelly tortured. They were mourning the fact that they were left all alone without any strong direction. And they undoubtedly mourned the realization that the ministry Jesus had called them to was hard enough when he was with them. How could they possibly do that ministry without him? In their surreal state, with memories of Good Friday and their Easter experience swirling all around them, the disciples had to take stock of who they really were and what were they capable of. And they knew. Oh, how they knew they were not very good at the craft of discipleship. They had not been good students of Jesus. They seldom understood his teachings. They didn't heal the way he could heal. And they didn't stand by him when all hell broke loose. Really, in their minds, the only thing they were good at was the thing that Jesus had called them away from. Fishing. And so they try to move past their mourning move past their confusion and their inadequacies, and they return to what they knew best. They go fishing. And that's why the disciples were in the boat early that morning, and that's why Jesus was standing on the shore watching them. Friends, haven't you any fish? And they said no, and Jesus says, then throw your net on the right side of that boat. You'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of that large number of fish. When Jesus asked the question, haven't you any fish? It was a rhetorical question. He already knew the answer. He could see that the labor of the night, the thing that the fishermen, his disciples were good at, had been unsuccessful. He knew that what they'd been doing was not productive even though it was all they knew how to do. And so Jesus meets them in their emptiness. He meets them in their defeat. He meets them in their weariness and lost home. He met them in that moment, and he showed them another way, the other side of the boat, a place rich in bounty. But again, this is not about fish. It's about more. It's about more because the disciples needed much more in that man. Jesus had commissioned these men 
to carry the good news to all nations. He had given them the authority to teach and to heal and to spread the kingdom. Jesus had envisioned his church and he set the foundation on Peter the rock. This wasn't about fishing better on the other side. This was about Jesus challenging his disciples to let go of what was familiar, to let go of their past, to let go of the safe and the predictable and do something different, to drop their nets where Jesus called them to and to find the miracle, an abundance in their lives. When Jesus told the disciples to cast their nets on the right side of the boat, it wasn't about catching fish with scales. It was about a different kind of catch. It was about a different way of living life. If it had been about fish, then it would have been redundant because professional fishermen would have cast their nets on both sides of the boat. This was something different. This was something deeper. This was Jesus recalling, reinvesting, and restoring his disciples to their ministry. The ministry they had shared before Good Friday and the Easter experience. This was about breaking into that familiar world that we so often retreat to when Christ calls us. This is about admitting that sometimes we work all night and we have absolutely nothing to show for our lives. They are empty. This is about Christ asking us if we've caught anything, if our lives are full. And it's about hearing our Lord challenging us to listen to his voice, to drop our nets, our lives, where he calls us to, which is often on the other side of who and where we are. And to feel that mirror, to feel the abundance of life lived in him. Jesus called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And if you've been a fisherman who had been fishing all night, there should be something to show for your efforts. But the disciples answered, no. No. We had caught nothing. And in their moment of connecting to their Lord, because remember, while they're in the boat, they think it is him. In that moment of connecting to their Lord, in that moment of being truthful and more aware, Christ challenges them to listen to him, to believe in him, to trust him, to consider something different and to respond in faith. Try throwing their net on the other side of the boat on the other side of life, to live out the truth of Easter and let their lives be resurrected. Friends, do you have any fish? If we translate that question into our own attempts to live on the other side of the Easter story, of trying to live resurrected lives, lives that are fuller and richer and deeper and more meaningful, then Christ is looking at us, bobbing along in our boat. And he's saying to us, how are you doing? How's your work? Do you feel useful? Are you happy in your job? Are you satisfied in your relationships? Have you found peace in your heart and in your mind? Are you fulfilled in the dreams that you've had? <clears throat> Does faith carry you? Does hope sustain you? Is life worth the effort? Do you have anything to show for whatever it is you spend your time doing? Whatever it is that you think you're good at, maybe best at, is this thing you are doing, is this life you are holding on to? Is this a place of joy? Is this a life in which you meet God regularly? Have you anything to show for how you spend your time 
and your energy? And if our answer is no, I haven't caught anything. I labored all night, but I have nothing to show. I'm confused. I'm angry. I'm depressed. I'm afraid. I'm lost. No, I have nothing to show. My net is empty. Then Christ says, then throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you'll find what you're looking for. Live the Easter experience. Let a dying life move to the other side of the boat, and let it be resurrected. A resurrection happened for the disciples that day in their boat. They trusted that voice, that familiar voice, and they dropped their nets on the other side of the boat. And then one of them confessed, the man on the shore was Jesus. And Peter jumped out of the boat and hurried to shore, and they counted up the catch, and there were 153 fish. A sign of abundance when Jesus Christ is directing and blessing their lives. And what then? Well, those resurrected lives in the boat that day became fishers of men and women. They became the church. And the church grew, and the church grew, until it became you. You are the one in the boat now. You are the one being asked if your net holds anything. Have you any fish? Easter should have changed us. We should not be the same people that we were a few weeks ago. Easter asks us to believe in the resurrection of our Lord and in the resurrection of our own lives. To be happier and more useful and more fulfilled in the lives that we've been given. If it's just another Easter day, if nothing has changed, if we're still bobbing along in whatever circumstances we were in before Easter, then we need to hear and be challenged by Jesus Christ today to let our nets down on the other side of what we've become. Christ is asking us to try the other side, to cast our nets in some other area in some other place, in some other way. He is calling us to let go of unfulfilled lives and live life with full nets. <laughs> the greatest danger that you and I face is that far too often we believe that if we try harder, if we expend great amounts of energy and time, then we can push unfulfilled and empty lives into becoming fulfilled. <laughs> And in some respects, there is truth in that. But Christ didn't tell his disciples to fish harder, or grow faster, or work longer hours. Instead, he told them to try something different, to look at things differently, to reclaim their calling, and to trust in him and follow his direction. It wasn't about doing something harder. It wasn't about casting nets over and over in the wrong place and spending life away from its purpose. It wasn't about putting more into going nowhere. Doing things harder is not always the answer. Take, for instance, the life or death struggle of a common fly caught in a window. And we've all seen it. A small fly burning out the last of its short life's energies in a futile attempt to fly through the glass. The whining wings tell the poignant story of that fly's strategy. I'll just try harder. But it doesn't work. The frenzied effort offers no hope for survival, and ironically, the struggle is part of the trap. It is impossible to fly for that fly to try hard enough to succeed at breaking through that glass. 
But nevertheless, that little tiny insect has staked its life on reaching its goal through effort and determination. But the fly is doomed. It will die there on the windowsill. Across the room, ten steps away, the door is wide open. A few seconds of flying time and that small creature could reach the outside world that it sees. With only a fraction of the effort now being wasted, it could be free of this self-imposed trap. It would be so easy. Why doesn't the fly try another approach? Something dramatically different. It's not always about trying harder, but trying something different. Easter is set before the Christian to give us the promise that life can be different. It is there to show us that resurrection can happen. It will give us new life in the end of time, but just as importantly, resurrection can give us new life in this moment. We can cast our nets all night. We can exhaust ourselves trying harder and harder to put fish in our net, but if those fish never come, if our nets and our lives remain empty, if we retreat to our old lives when Christ seems distant, if we labor in vain and can't understand our purpose, then we need to stop and listen for that quiet voice coming from the shore. We need to change our mindset and be open to letting go of trying desperately to go nowhere and start looking to where Christ is leading us to new life and full events. Jesus says to us, friends, haven't you any fish? And when we say no, he says, then throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you will find some. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for calling us as fishers of men and women. Thank you for the promise that Christ continues to call to us from the shore, that he knows where our nets should be dropped. Help us to trust him, Father, and to be open to his direction. May we cast our nets and our lives in accordance with his holy will. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 689, Simply Trusting Every Day.
going to be uh, offering the basket is at the back in the narthex, so you can feel free to drop your envelope or gift in there. Uh, but we always uh, recognize and ask uh, for our offerings and tithings to be recognized by God, that we're returning them to God as best that we can. And so we always have a dedication on those, those offerings. Let's bow our heads then for that prayer. Father, you have given us this world and all that is in it. You have given us all the ordinary, necessary things for daily life and all the wonderful, beautiful things which inspire us and uplift us. We ask that as we bring our tithes and offerings that you might bless what we bring and give us the wisdom to use them in accordance with your will. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'd ask you once again to come in prayer prayer of thanksgiving, and our intercession for others. Let's pray. Father, we take these moments to give you thanks for all your gifts to us. Thank you for the blessings all around us, for the miracle of creation and the joys that we find in it every day. Thank you, too, for the gifts of one another, the touch and concern of family members, the devotion of good friends, the help we receive daily from our neighbors and co-workers and strangers who extend us a simple kindness. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings, and help us to remember in our prayers those who are not as fortunate. We know that there are persons out of work today, and that there are families where only one parent struggles to provide a home. We remember that there are places where crops will not grow and the land is dying. We know that there are many for whom this day is one of physical pain or mental and emotional anguish. Father, for the many who find themselves living in the valley of despair and lost hope, grant to them a renewed faith and a new courage to face their struggles. Help the broken and injured among us to trust in your love and your care. Touch them with your peace, which passes all understanding, and grant to them your healing presence. And Father, let us not pass by such persons, but help us where we can to speak and act kindly and caringly to all those that we do find in pain. Father, into your hands, we must ultimately place our lives. Help us to be trusting and open to your guidance in all that comes to us in life. Fill us now with your spirit and take the best of who and what we are, that we might serve your will and witness to others of your great love. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to save and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our closing hymn is number 634. Will you come and follow me?
direct our lives in the direction that Jesus calls us to. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.